I am very encouraged and excited about sharing this message with you. And if you open your Bibles to the book of Revelation, chapter 2, and we're going to be talking about the church of Ephesus, the church of Ephesus. But let's just open up in prayer. Father God, we love you. We thank you, Father God, for your word. We thank you, Lord, that you're speaking to us, that you're living an active word. And God, we just pray, liven us up and charge us, Lord, for this year, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. Well, Revelation chapter 2 is talking to the church of Ephesus. Jesus is talking to the church of Ephesus. But let's go back and look at the founding of the church in Ephesus. I'm going to read a little bit to you just so you can kind of get a a grid for Ephesus. Ephesus was like a metropolis. People did business with, uh, if it, sort of like the New York of its day where all these merchants are coming back and forth and whatever. And then all of a sudden Paul comes in there and begins to preach the gospel and just rocks Ephesus for Jesus. And so in this writing here about the uh, church of Ephesus, it says the church age began at Pentecost, which is Acts chapter 2. It was birthed in Jerusalem. The church spread rapidly. Remember, there was no church until Pentecost. When Pentecost came, the church began that day. So literally, when it was birthed in Jerusalem, it began to spread. So often we're looking like, how come the church is not spreading? Could it be that because we're not spreading, right? Think about this. So it was birthed in Jerusalem. The church spread rapidly through the ministry of the apostles and the early believers, then fanned by persecution. Isn't that amazing that persecution caused the church to grow? Then it was fanned by persecution. The gospel flame spread to other cities and nations. And on three courageous journeys, Paul and his associates established local assemblies, church bodies, throughout the Roman Empire. So Paul, remember, is called to the Gentiles. You may remember that from Cornelius' house where God showed Peter that the Gentiles were going to be brought in like the Jews were brought in. And then Paul tried to preach to the the Jews, but God said, no, you're going to go to the Gentiles. And he went and just birthed churches and won people to the Lord, and churches were established because of that in the Roman Empire. Look to your neighbor and say, that's awesome. That's awesome. One of the most prominent of those churches was the church of Ephesus. Look to your neighbor and say, the church of Ephesus. It's not a book in your Bible. It's actually a church that was in the city of Ephesus. You can name your city the church of whatever your city is. It was established by Paul in 52 AD towards the end of his second missionary journey. But Paul returned to Ephesus a year later. So he He started first ministering there, and then one year later, he comes back to minister again. On his third journey, he stayed there for three years. For three years. How long did Jesus stay with the disciples? Three years. So Paul spent three years of his life in Ephesus, ministering and preaching the gospel, preaching and teaching with great effectiveness. Talks about that in Acts chapter 19, verse 1 through 20. When Paul moved on from Ephesus, he left Timothy, 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy. He left his spiritual son, Timothy, there to lead the church. You can see that in 1 Timothy 1.3. As Paul was traveling to Jerusalem near the end of his third journey, he called the elders of the Ephesian church to meet him on a nearby island called Maltus, Acts chapter 20, verse 17 through 38 a meeting that was filled with great sadness because he was leaving them for what he thought would be the last time he ever saw them again. So it's like, this is the last time you'll ever see this person who led you to the Lord, who mentored you, who taught you, who preached the gospel to you, who brought you into the kingdom of God. And just a few years later, Paul was sent as a prisoner to Rome. So here he is preaching the gospel in the Roman Empire, but eventually he become a prisoner in that city. Welcome to ministry. <laughs> so while there, he was visited by messengers from various churches, including Tychicus from Ephesus. Paul wrote a letter that he called, we call the book of Ephesians. That's a letter he wrote to the church of Ephesus in your Bible. And he sent it back with Tychicus back to the church, uh, not writing to be deal with some conspiracy heresies and things going on in the church. Because quite often as an apostle, you're having to deal with foundational issues, crazy things going on. There was nothing 
crazy going on, but he wrote letters of encouragement. It was a letter of encouragement to him. In it, Paul described the nature and appearance of the church and challenged believers to function as the living body of Christ on the earth. Think about all that. It's a, it's, that's, that's the church of Ephesus. Like, this is an amazing church. Look to your neighbor and say, this is an amazing church, right? But what's so wild about it, when you think about this, Jesus talks about this church in the book of Revelations. Look at Revelations chapter, Revelations chapter, I think Revelations chapter 2, verse 1, where Jesus is talking about the, uh, to the church of Ephesus. And you think, well, this is an amazing church. How could anything be wrong? You know, we can all be guilty of going because we walk so successfully with the Lord at a season our life, season of our life. We can assume that it's all good. Yeah, I got this thing. I got this thing figured out. Paul writes to several cities like that. One was Galatia. He goes, who bewitched you? You were running a good race. Now you're, you're doing something totally different than what happened because you believed. Now, the church of Ephesus, when you're listening and reading Revelation, Revelation is a revelation of Jesus Christ. This is Jesus speaking. This is Jesus speaking to John for us. So Jesus is speaking. This is not this is this is Jesus speaking. People have done a lot of wild things with these seven letters to the churches, but listen, if Jesus is speaking, you better take it seriously because we have to answer alone before God. So we need to pray and say, God, if you're speaking to me as one of these churches, I want to be right with you. I want to be right with you. And, and Ephesus is an amazing church because they're doing such a great work for God. So, and we've been studying about angels lately and re- understanding how God uses the heavenly host. Well, if you read the book of Revelation, it says, to the angel of the church of Ephesus, to the angel of the church of, of Smyrna, to the angel to the church, to the angel of the church of Philadelphia. I mean, there's angels that are doing the bidding and the works of God. So Jesus is speaking to John for us, and he says, To the angel, this is Revelation chapter 2, verse 1. To the angel of the church of Ephesus write, these are the word of him. Say, that's Jesus. These are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks amongst the lampstands. Think about that. The seven stars, the angels, and the lampstands. Think about the lampstands. He says, I know your deeds. Yeah, Jesus knows what I'm doing for him. Look to your neighbor. Here's what I'm doing for him. I know your deeds, your hard work, and your perseverance. Yeah, it's me. I know you cannot tolerate wicked people. That you have tested those who claim to be apostles, which means sent ones, but are not, and have found them false, wolves in sheep's clothing. You have, pres- you have persevered and have dur- endured hardship for my name's sake. Not only did you persevere, but when it came time for you standing for God and standing for Jesus and you standing for your testimony, you stood and you endured hardship for my name. And you haven't grown weary. <laughs> well, 2022, 2019, <laughs> it was some weary years, right? It's like, woo, we'll talk more about that. Yeah. So think about all these things. And then Jesus said, yet, yeah, this is Jesus. Look to your neighbors, look to your neighbors, this is Jesus. You get to understand this is Jesus talking prophetically, which means he's speaking back then about now. He says, Yeah, I'll hold this against you. You have forsaken your first love. Consider how far you have fallen. Fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. What? But you have this in your favor. It's like a father dealing with a child, right? I'm so disappointed right now, but you did really good here. But listen, you got to deal with this in your life, right? He's like, he's like, but you know, you have this in your favor. You hate the practices of the Nicolaitans, 
not the Nickelodeons, but the Nickelations, which I also hate. So think about that. People say, well, God doesn't hate. Boom. There's Jesus saying, he's a lot, it's seven things he talks about and he hates. Just so, there's those that cause division and derision and lying and all that kind of stuff. He says, whoever has ears, let him hear what the Spirit, Holy Spirit, says to the churches. To the one who is victorious, to the one who is victorious, to the one, say the one, to the one who is victorious. It's like, I thought we were all victorious. To the one who is victorious, I will give him the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. God created the heavens and the earth and the animals and the shrubs, and then he created man in his own image. And he said, listen, it's all yours, son. Anything you want, listen, anything you want on the earth, just don't eat from this one tree, right? Tree of knowledge of good and evil. And so he ate, him and he and Eve ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And so they got God sent an angel to have mercy to get them out of the garden because if they would have taken and eaten from the tree of life after they've eaten from the tree of death, they would have been absent in death forever. There would have been no hope for a salvation. And so he didn't run them out of the garden because he was angry with, I mean, well, yeah. He didn't run them out of the garden because it was over because of what they did. He ran them out of the garden because he had a redemption plan in store for them. Praise the Lord, right? And so it's interesting, too, that he that overcomes, I will give him the right to eat from the tree of life. So what we lost in the garden, because when one man fell, we all fell. If we walk with Jesus and don't fall from our first love with him, he'll give us the right to what? Eat from the tree of life. What we lost in the garden, we get back through Jesus in the paradise of God. So I thought what was pretty interesting here is, you know, we're coming into a, a year, we're coming into a place of um, just much attack on, on the church, much attack and persecution happening around the world. Um, people are busy about many things. You know, we're, we're in a day-to-day -day where people are busy with many things. But the question is, are we busy about the right things, right? There's so many things we could be doing. And so Jesus is talking to us, all of us, and he's saying, listen, I know your deeds. I know your deeds. So first of all, that lets us know that he knows everything. He knows our faults. He knows what we meditate in our heart. He knows what we're doing. He knows our deeds, which means also, not in a negative light, but the fact that, you know, you're doing what's right before God. You're, you're, you're being that husband, you're being that wife, you're being that son, that daughter, that mother, the father, the boss, the pastor, whatever you're doing. If you're doing it for God, God knows you're doing it. You're not doing anything for him in vain. Everything is being recorded in the books forever, except for your sin if you repent, right? Let your neighbor say, praise the Lord that he forgives our sins and remembers it no more. You want your sins blotted out of the books, not your name blotted out of the book of life, right? He says, I know your deeds and your hard work. This is so important while I'm talking about this because maybe you're, you just you love the Lord so much and you've just dedicated your life to doing the best you can to serve God. You're abiding you're, and you're just working hard and you're persevering. He says, I know your perseverance and I know that, man, you just, you're repulsed by wicked people. I mean, the second they start running their mouth, you're going like, you almost literally want to throw up. It's like, just, yeah, that's just crazy. Wicked people. Look at you and everything. Wicked people. Yeah, wicked people. There's wicked people, literally. I mean, if you can't discern wicked people before we even got to falling away, you follow, you got to like, oh my goodness. And you know, we were all wicked people that got saved, and God saved us and delivered us. And he says, you know, I know that you can't, you don't tolerate any wicked people, which is okay to have zero tolerance for people who are evil. It's okay. It's all right. It's okay to go, listen, don't think so. Just not going to hear that. Don't go there. Don't want to hear it. And he says, and you test 
And don't just accept people who call themselves apostles. Apostle means sent one. If anybody's a believer, you are an apostle in the context that God has sent you. But a lot, a lot of people, you know, they just, you know, something draws them to a place of them wanting to talk about a God they don't know, to preach about a kingdom they don't, they're not in and they won't enter. And uh, they have wicked motivations. You know, they, they'd rather have ministry than Jesus. Crazy, true. And said, don't take my salvation from me. They're like, don't take my ministry from me. He's like, what are you talking about? <laughs> ministry is servant. Anyway, so, so, so he says, you've tested them, which means you're not critical. You're not critical. You know, you're, you're listening, you're, you're, but you're watching. So you're watching. You're watching the person because you want to see their fruit. How did they treat that person? How did they... How, what is there? Do they have love coming out of their life? They talk about Jesus, but do they show you Jesus? Are they are they merciful? Are they kind? Do they identify and don't tolerate wicked folks in their presence? Type thing. And so, so that's not a judgmental thing. I mean, you are you're making a judgment. It's okay to make a judgment. We can't. We're not going to talk about that message right now. You're called to 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 righteously judge a situation. He's saying right here, you're looking at people who says that they're apostles and they're not. They're wolves in sheep's clothing. And then he goes on and says, you persevere. So this is a different perseverance. You persevere and endure hardship for Jesus' name. So this other perseverance is just doing life. Life is just difficult sometimes. It's, it's somebody told somebody that life was easy. And it's like, oh, you, it hasn't happened to you yet. <laughs> but once it happens to you, you'll realize it takes perseverance. You know, I'm writing in my book about perseverance, and it's like it just success will come in your life when you understand that it. it's not, you know, some people, you know, uh, when they see that life's difficult, instead of running for a plan, they run for medication and drugs and some sort of distraction or media. It's a monkey. I can never think of that monkey doing that. Anyway, so they're, they're literally they're they're going through persecution, persecution, and they're being they're persevering through enduring because they're suffering not because of our mistakes. We suffer a lot of times for our mistakes. Listen, most of the things is stuff where we failed, but there's times when we stand and we do what Jesus tells us to do, and we're suffering in that. And, and understand that. To say that you earn any of your salvation is to say that the, it's, a, it's an affront to the cross and the price that Jesus paid on the cross. We're saved by faith through grace. God had mercy on us. And so this is about a relationship with God. So it's not like, hey, since I don't tolerate wicked people, since I don't put up with false, fake, fake news, fake believers, you know, wolves in sheep's clothing, I, I stand up for the Ten Commandments and I won't the prayer back in school again, that kind of stuff, right? <laughs> that all of a sudden the self-righteousness can come in and you start thinking you're right before God because look at all the stuff you're doing. I mean, you're doing way more now than you did before. That's what he told the church of Thyatira, to the, church of, to the angel of the church of Thyatira. He says, you're, doing, you're working harder than you've ever worked before. But then he goes, but I have this against you. We'll get there. So this is a lot of stuff. So it'd be great that's going on at the church. So, so he says, and you haven't even grown weary in doing this. Well, I've grown weary. I don't know about you, but I grow weary. <laughs> you know, I'm like, oh, okay, you done that one right there. Think about the weary. The definition of weary is having your strength much exhausted by toil or violent exertion. Tired, fatigued, having your patience exhausted or your mind is just yielded to discouragement, causing weariness or tiresomeness to reduce or exhaust the physical strength where your physical strength is just exhausted of your body to tire, to fatigue, to make impatient of continuous you know, I don't want to go anymore type stuff. To harass by anything irksome. 
<laughs> right? And it seems like a lot of stuff is irksome today. It's like, well, okay, well. So they didn't even become weary. They didn't become weary. And, and the years that we just had past us is nothing like the years they had. They didn't have a democracy. They didn't have a democratic republic. They didn't have a constitution. They had dictators that would say, off with your head, the people that, that thought they were God, right? And so we didn't have it. We don't have it as bad as they've had it. So all this great stuff, right? And then Jesus says, yet, say yet, yet. Look at your neighbor and say, yet. <laughs> it's like, why are you saying yet? This is an amazing report card, Jesus. Aren't I doing well? He says, yet, I hold this against you. Me. The Son of God, Jesus, God, has something against me? Look at all the stuff I'm doing. Look at all the pain I've gone through. Look at all the wicked people. I was like, out of here. Let me be interested. It's like, he's trying to give you hope, but you're getting offended. Yet, Jesus, yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love you had at first. You have forsaken your first love with me. I thought, I thought all the stuff I was doing for you was love. No, it was when you first started, but now it's just turned into a religious work. You're not doing it because you love me. You're doing it because somebody told you you had to. There was a day that you were so excited about serving me. You do anything for me. It was just so, it's a loving moment. But now all I hear about is your report card. I'm doing this and I'm doing that. And this should be, how come I don't have this by now? And it's like, I'm sure it's nobody that's watching this, right? He says, yet... I hold this against you. I think it's very important to understand. We're going to break this down. We're not going to spend two, we're not going to fly past this because so many people read these things and they go, you know, well, it's not me. That's not me. But he says, yet, which means up until this present day, uh, specific time, by now, nevertheless, you imagine that you made an A in history. You made an A in language. You made an A in math. You made an A in reading. You made an A in physical education. Yet, nevertheless, you're not going to school out of love. Like, it's school, Jesus. <laughs> it's, it's just college. And so he's literally gave this amazing list of awesome, amazing things that potentially are advancing the kingdom of God, and people are getting saved and all that. But he's confronting this church we just talked about with Paul, birth in Rome. When the church was persecuted, he went there. Remember the three journeys he went there? He spent three years with the church of Ephesus. And now all these years later, Jesus himself is going to, what happened to Paul? <laughs> Can Paul come back? He's like, Jesus is saying, let me speak to you for a minute, Ephesus. He's, yeah, I'll hold this against you. That's so important to understand because there's this gospel being preached that you can't offend Jesus, you can't hurt Jesus, there's nothing you could do to Jesus. But let me tell you something. Every time we sin, every time we, uh, we can offend him, we can, we can hurt him, we have to understand that because if we don't understand the pain of sin, the process that he had to go through to take our sin on, the gruesomeness and the pain of the cross, we won't understand the thing that we have to understand to be able to bring us out of this place of sin. He says, yet I'll hold this against you. You have forsaken your first love. So forsaken, let's look at that. Forsaken, to quit. Think about it, to quit. It means, ain't no love here, Pharisee. <laughs> ain't no love here, Sadducee, right? To quit, for a second, it means to quit, to leave entirely. It's like, it's not like you're like a, a, gauge, a gauge of one to a hundred and you're down to five or something. It's like zero <laughs> for a second. 
to quit, to leave entirely, to desert, to abandon, to depart from, to renounce, to reject, to leave, to withdraw from, to fail, or fallen. To fa- fallen, forsaken. So Jesus is going like, you missed something here. <laughs> For God so loved the world, he loves you, loves you, that he gave his son to die for you so that you could be in relationship with him, relationship with him, and you together with him out of love, obeying him. Man, it's like, how could a church, how could a believer, how could a Christian, and there's so many things being preached I'm just telling you the Word of God. Focus on the Word of God. If people contradict Scripture, don't listen to them. And so then he says, he says right here, he says, Jesus is saying, he said, consider how far you have fallen. He said, consider it. So when you think about, originally when he's talking about the works, your deeds, your works, your perseverance, not wicked people, That's human doings, works. But then he says, yet you have fallen from your first love, which is human beings. You're doing it out of love, being with God. Then he says, consider how far you've fallen. Have fallen. Consider is a very interesting word, very important for us to understand because it gives, gives us permission. Jesus is saying, take some time with this. Let your neighbor say, take some time with this. Let your other neighbors say, pay attention, pay attention. <laughs> it's a perfect time if you're going into a time of fasting and prayer. This is what you should be focused on right here. Consider means this. Consider how far you've fallen. Consider means to fix the mind on, to fix your mind on it. With a view to carefully examine, to have an examination, to think on and take in with instant care, pondering and studying and meditating on what I'm talking to you about. So he's literally saying, pay attention. You've fallen here. You fall, you have fallen. But he's not saying I'm writing you off. He's saying, listen, I want to write you in. I don't want your lampstand gone whether it's your ministry, your place, or whatever it is. He says, he says, listen, consider to view attentively, to observe, to examine, to attend, to have regard to, to respect, to take into view an examination, into an account, to estimate it, to think uh, seriously, maturely, and carefully about, to deliberate, to turn, turn in your mind, and you're taking it, and you're like, you're taking like a Rubik's Cube and you're just like, hmm, hmm, if I, hmm, if I've fallen from my first love. Ask the people around you, they probably could tell you. It's like, <laughs> uh. you see, if, if we've left our first love, this sounds like works to you. This sounds like, oh my goodness, now I have to focus on my first love. Versus like, there's joy. There's, there's a lack of weariness in the first love. We've fallen from our first love. Everything becomes weir- tiresome and, and we're weary because we're thinking too much about this life and not realizing that it's God that's given us progression. He's, we're going and doing what he wants us to do. And he says, consider, which is just definitely take time. I want to encourage you, if you haven't thought about it, go on a time of fasting and prayer. Say, you know what? I'm going to consider this, God. Jesus, I'm going to consider this. I don't care how we started. I don't care what happened with Paul and his three missions. I do care, but I'm like, I want to know where I am now, Jesus. I want to be with you now. I want that joy back in my life, the joyous joy back in my life again. And he said, consider how far you have fallen. The word far means distant in any direction, separated by a wide space from its place, i.e. first love, right? Remote for purpose, contrary to design and wishes, 
remote in affections, obedience, and enmity with, align, align, uh, alienated, I'm trying to read my writing here, and in a spiritual sense, we're alienated from God and more or most distant from the two. So you have this distance, you have this distance, you have this distance, and you have this distance. Far means not this one, not this one, not this one, but the furthest you can go. That's what far means. is like there ain't no further you can go. You have fallen. That's what he's saying. You have fallen. You have fallen. And the word have means it literally is you're owning it, to possess it, to hold it. He's not saying you're going to fall. He said you have fallen to the church of Ephesus. He says you have fallen. Literally, it means, you know, you married this thing. You're, you're in bed with it. You're, you've fallen. You no longer, you got to, it's, you own it. You own it. But something so refreshing when you could say, that's me. Because you know what you can do then? You can repent. <laughs> But if you blame everybody else for your sin and you get to the throne room of God, you're going to find out no witnesses, no suspects. You stand there alone, nobody to blame anything on, and you have to decide here what you're going to do there because you can't decide there. It's over there. Either way. So Jesus is telling us. He's saying This is what's going on. This is what's happening. Is this you? Have you lost the joy of your salvation? Have you, have you been looking at everything that once you did with joy, now you're like begrudgingly doing anything for God? You bring them up when you have to. Maybe you even abide, but you do it religiously instead of relationally. Maybe this is not for you. This is, maybe not. So it brings us to this point. Thank God for God telling us in advance what could be the outcome if we don't do the next thing that he tells us to do, if that's us. He says, repent. When we're caught up with a religious mindset, people would never consider about rep oh, repent. Look at the churches. Look at this. Look at that. Look at this. Look at, look at all the stuff I'm doing. I didn't put up with them wicked people. I identified faults, you know, wolves and sheep and apostles and non-apostles and prophets and non-prophets. It's amazing today. It's like, there's no discernment of all. If anybody tell, it seems like there's no discernment at all. People are not putting any effort to find out, why are you repeating that prophecy? You don't even know who they are. <laughs> what if you are part of a false prophet and you're repeating what they're saying, but you put no effort to determine whether they were sent from God or not? See what I'm saying? It's like, we got to hear the, the fear of the Lord and, and get in connection with him. And he says, repent. Let your neighbor say, repent. This is important because we talked about the pain of the cross and the pain that Jesus took on of our sin. I mean, he got beat for us, not because of himself. He got pierced for us, not because he got crucified because of us, not because of him. There's pain in it. He says, so, so repent is not, this is what it's come to quite often with folks just like, God, forgive me. You just murdered 15 people with your mouth. Forgive you. Right? You have no brokenness at all in your life. You have no sorrow. You don't realize what you just did as the devil took your tongue and you massacred all those people. There's no sorrow. There's no brokenness in your heart. Repent means to feel pain, sorrow, regret. Hello, regret. Something that you've done or something that you've spoken to express sorrow for something in the past, to change your mind in, 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 the, in the consequences of, uh, of, of your feeling that potency of punishment coming in your life because you haven't dealt with that sin in your life at the cross. 
in dealing with a, a supreme being, the course of knowing that what's going to happen to us. You have to understand, without Jesus, you're looking at eternal judgment and damnation where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth forever, forever. God doesn't send anybody there. You choose to go there. I don't want to go there, Jesus. <laughs> I don't want to go there. Uh, in regards to repentance and theological, the theology in regards to the sorrow or the pains for sin as a violation of God's holy law or to dishonor his character, his government, the phallus ingratitude towards uh, being an infinite loving being. In other words, God's just so loving towards us and he's so benevolent towards us. And we're just like, whatever, whatever. But if you're repentant, you're going like, how could I have done this to such a loving God? Paul, David said, against you and you only have us end. <clears throat> to repent means to remember with sorrow. Notice the theme of this. Sorrow, 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 sorrow. Does your neighbor say sorrow? Sorrowful. <laughs> right? Sorrowful. You know, that's how you know. I mean, if you have a child and your child comes and go like, I'm sorry for that. It's like, no, you're not. <laughs> right? But if they come to you and they go like, I, I'm so sorry. I mean, they're not acting, but they, you know, they're they literally feel their their brokenness and they're just going, I shouldn't have talked to you like that, Mama. I was so I'm so sorry, you know. And it just immediately comes out of the heart of that parent if it hasn't been some continuous abuse over a period of time where that child just abused the parent. Go figure, right? <laughs> then they immediately go, Oh, it's okay. We can get past this. And if you, being evil, know how to do that with your child, how much more does your father in heaven, right? He's good. So again, repentance is defined as sorrow for anything done or said, done or said, the pain or grief which a person experiences in consequences of particular injury that you're, you face because of what's going on and produced a negative thing in your life. In theology, the pain, regret, or affliction which a person feels on the account of their past conduct because of what they've done and knowing that the punishment that's awaiting them lest they repent, it's sorrowful. Being, sor being broken. Being, say, be broken. Be broken for our sin. It's like if, in fact, we don't feel broken anymore for our sin, we're in a dangerous place. That means... If you don't feel bad how you're treating somebody, you don't love them. <laughs> you don't love them if you just do anything and you hurt that person. You don't love them. Because if you love them, you're thinking, oh, I'm so sorry. I shouldn't have said that that way. You know, I'm, so I'm sorry. Um, even, you know, if, even if you just went there and you shouldn't have went there, you just feel bad about it. And you want to like, oh, I'm just, please forgive me. And there's a lot of people, they're just hard-hearted and they have no sorrow for what they do. And they know that, you know, God says, I got to say, I'm sorry. So they go, I'm sorry. But there's no sorrow for it. And so, and there's some people that are just sorry. They just think about all the time. Oh, my sin. Oh, my sin, right? But that kind of sorrow doesn't lead you anywhere. There's a godly sorrow we'll talk about that leads you to repentance. But if you don't have that sorrow in your heart, you never make it to a place of repentance. You may make it to a confessional, but you won't make it to a place of repentance. So to repent or do the things is repent and do, Jesus, when Jesus is talking to the church, he says, repent and do the thing you did at first. You don't go, well, I'm doing all this. I'm not tolerating wicked people. I'm, I'm, I'm dealing with people that are, that are saying they're of you, they're not of you. You just go, yes, Lord. 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 And do what you did at first, which obviously wasn't a list of those long works that Jesus talked about. That counted for nothing <laughs> outside of, and, and other people might have got saved by, by it. Other people, might be, other people might be in love with Jesus because of what you did. But the question is, are you still in love with Jesus? Have you left your first love? Look at all the people that love you, Jesus. Yeah, it's a shame you left it. Yeah, and they are loving me. You can preach about a kingdom that other people will enter that you will never darken the doors of. Matthew chapter 7. Jesus talks about that.
So when we return to our, remember what it was like when you first, when God first found you. Remember, oh, he had no idea he was going to just, just flip your world around and take all that pressure off of you and forgive you of all these things. You didn't even know that was wrong. Now you realize how bad it was because you've heard the word of God and you felt the presence of God. You heard the truth of God preach and you realize that the weightiness of your sin came on you. And all of a sudden Jesus says, but I will forgive you. I will cleanse you from all unrighteousness and I will, I'll bring you in and you'll be part of my family. You'll be in right standing with God and that, that freshness, there was no pride because you didn't have nothing to offer. There was nothing. You had no works. You, hadn't, you don't even know what works are yet. You know, you don't, you haven't got this whole laundry list of, oh, that's a wicked person. You know, you can, never, you can be, anyway, I'll talk about too many things. It was first love. You can't get enough of him. You read your Bible? Oh my goodness! Like I, got to, I need to get, I need to get along, read my Bible, so I gotta get the Word of God. And oh my goodness, I want to know more about you, Jesus. You're listening to teachings. You're listening to to preaching. You're you're hanging out with people who love Jesus because you're so in love with Him, right? The thing you did at first, your first love. And I was like, we gotta go to church. <laughs> Do you know they say the further someone moves away from their family, the further they actually get away from God if they have a Christian family? Isn't that crazy? Be careful when somebody's trying to move you away from your family if they're not going after God. I don't talk about anybody in particular. I'm just telling you a stat that just came out. So it's important to remember why we're doing what we're doing. We love God. God loves us first. We encounter him. He saves us. He forgives us. We're in right standing with him. That's our first love. Like, wow, you forgave me. I feel so squeaky clean. You know, everything's so, I can't, I'm my, oh, you're talking about Jesus this, Jesus that. You're doing all kinds of amazing things, you know. And, and everything you're doing, you're doing and saying because you love him. So it, it's coming from an overflow of loving him. You're like, oh my goodness. I remember when, when I uh, first God saved, you know, went and got in, uh, uh, Pastor John Kilpatrick was and still is my pastor. But I went to apply for a Bible school and they said I wasn't saved long enough to go to Bible school. <laughs> and so, but it didn't make it. So, so I remember going to college, you know, you know, I was going to go to a Christian college, but now I had to go to a, a secular college, but that actually was God's plan for me at that time. And I'm going through the hallway, stairways of the college, and I'm just so in love with God. I got a Gideon Bible, you know. I'm like getting off in corners, and I'm like reading about, gee, I could see a Gideon's Bible a little small. And, and then, you know, I'd go to my car during the breaks and listen to some teachings or whatever, and I just couldn't get enough of him. And then I remember passing this young man in the, in the hallway, a stairway, and he looks at me, he goes, are you a Christian? Is that the reason why you're happy all the time? <laughs> I wasn't putting on happiness. I was happy. God saved me. You know, I, I'm, I'm born again. I've fallen in love with a God who's in love with me. You know, and then, you know, it just, it just couldn't get enough of him. I would do, I give up everything for him. Out of love. Out of love. Then you start going through the life situation. Then you start going through dealing with the wicked people and the people who, who are, you know, religious Pharisees, or you deal with people who are not doing things for God out of love. They're just beating you with it, right? I mean, and just crazy things are going on, right? And then you're dealing with yourself going through the journey. And so at some point, you got to wait a minute and say, wait a minute, is there, I used to always say, is like, can you be born again, again, <laughs> right? Because you're saying like, how can I get to the place that I was when I was first born again? And the Lord says, return to your first love. Because if you're doing all those things, but you're not loving, those things don't count for anything for you. They don't get you in anywhere, even though they're effective works.
Everything that you do should come from the overflow of a loving, personal, abiding, hanging in there with him, relationship with Jesus. He's the one that saved us. While we were yet sinners, at our worst, Jesus died for us. So why in the world would you think anything that you're going to do is going to make God more in love with you? The question is, have you left that love? Well, you're less in love with God. And the word far means you're not there anymore. You're not there anymore. Far means the furthest distance you possibly can go. And it has happened, he's saying. But at this point, you could look at this thing as going, at this, at this message, you could think, well, this is being difficult. This is being hard. This is hopeful. It's the joy of your salvation. David said, Lord, may you, if you'll just forgive me and, and bring me back to a place of the joy of my salvation. You know, when he actually sinned and he sinned with uh, Bathsheba and he, he killed her husband and this crazy things that went on. You know, when kings should be at war. And he's, he said his sin was breaking his bones. It's like, but you know what? He says, you're, you're, he says the weightiness of what's going on, my bones are being crushed. But he says, Lord, if you'll forgive me, if you'll cleanse me with his hip, he said, which is the blood, he says, I will teach other people your ways. And there was like, I want to get back to this joy again. And what was weighting him down wasn't God. What was weighting him down was murder. <laughs> was adultery, was all these things that he had done that God will forgive him of and bring him back to a place of, of purity before God only because of what Jesus did on the cross. But he first had to be forgiven. And the joy of our salvation comes back. Fruit that comes from our life, when we abide, like John chapter 15, when Jesus is saying, if you abide in me and I abide in you, then you'll bear much fruit. But if you don't abide in me, you'll be cut down and thrown into the fire. You're not going to bear any fruit. Oh, he's not going like you're, you're, religious, you're, you're religiously tied to me. He's going, listen, I loved you. I brought you in. I grafted you in. We're so excited. We're doing this thing together. And you left me. That's what he's saying. He said, come back. Come back. And walk with me. And so it comes out of a, the fruit in our life is what comes out of a personal connection and relationship with Jesus Christ because we love him and because he loves us. You know, that, that we're not, you can't, you've already accomplished everything. You're already at a place of success already. How can you get any more successful than that? The rest of your life is a gratitude and obedience and love because this one he may choose for this person, this is their path. And this person may choose, this is their path. And this one he may give five talents to, this one may give two talents to, this one he may give one talent to. It's not what other people are doing, it's what God's doing with you. It's what he's doing with you in your life. <sighs> I just really want us to begin to soak on the reality of our first love. I really believe that as we, we're entering into the season, don't get caught up in what you can do. Get caught up in who did it for you. Begin to return your life. Turn, return back. Remember what you were at first when God first called you, when he found you laying in your pool of blood and everybody rejected you, everybody left you, and he looked at you and he said, Live! And he adorned you and he brought, he parted his robe and he brought you into himself. That you weren't trying to achieve something, trying to accomplish something. You weren't trying to get the next biggest business or the next biggest church or the next biggest ministry or this perfect relationship. You were just in love with him. In love with him. And everybody, I don't care if it's your spouse, your parents, your children, your people in your church, your coworkers, anybody in your country, in the nations of the world, everybody has to make a choice with Jesus. And everybody's been given a free will. So I want to start this, this, this talk, this conversation that we're having about first love. Say first love. 
close your eyes for a moment. Just close your eyes. Don't pay attention to any distractions going on. Do you remember who you were when he first found you? Do you remember, you remember when the weight of your sin was heavy, but he lifted it off your life? Do you remember his love that he's demonstrated and he showed you when you didn't even know what love was? How he rescued you. I want to encourage you to begin to say, you know what, Lord? There's tons of distractions in this world. Tons of media distractions, entertainment distractions, religious distractions, wicked people distractions, all kinds of things. But you know what? I'm going to focus on you, Jesus. I'm going to focus on you. I'm going to put you first. I'm going to put you first because I love you. And, and, and I want to, I want to, we're going to continue talking this, but right now I want to say, you might not be feeling this. If you're not feeling it, you need to say, God, I want to feel it. <laughs> this ain't good, God. I know it's not good if I'm not feeling it. I'm not feeling soft heart. I'm hard hearted, God. My heart is grown hard with the things that I've done or things that other people have done to me. And I don't feel, I'm not feeling it. God, give me that, that sorrow. We'll talk about in a future message that there's a godly sorrow. There's this, this worldly sorrow that just makes you depressed and puts you on medications. But there's godly sorrow that brings you to a place of repentance, that makes brings you to a place of happiness and joy. Worldly sorrow is a continual weight that never leaves you. That's some of the world. Godly sorrow is the reality of our sin, the horrificness of it, what God had to do to deal with it and what we have to do to get it out of our life. And when he forgives us, we're forgiven. We're forgiven. We're cleansed. We're in right relationship with him. We're born again. Again, possibly. He's talking to the church. Jesus is talking to the church. He's not talking to the world. He's talking to the church of Ephesus, you know, the one that Paul started when the church was being persecuted. And he went, it was there on three missionary journeys. He's talking to the church of Ephesus that he's that Paul spent three years with. See, a lot of times people are caught up with the Paul and don't realize Jesus is the one that's doing this through Paul. And you'll be talking to Jesus because Jesus is speaking directly now to the church of Ephesus to say, listen to me. <laughs> All right. Don't get, don't, don't they, understand if somebody brought you the gospel, God brought you the gospel through that person. This is all about Jesus, 100% Jesus. And he loves you. He's got a plan for your life. Listen, this is a perfect time to go into a place of prayer and fasting and go, God, I want to have that first love for you. And maybe you don't know him. Maybe you've never made Jesus Christ the Lord of your life. Maybe you're not this person that once walked with God and you had these great encounters with a, an apostle like Paul and you had these great relationships and now you've gone astray and you left your first love. You haven't done anything, but you're finding out that this God loves you and has a plan for your life. God, the creator of the universe who holds the stars in his hands, who holds the stars in his hands. He uses the moon and the stars as signs to speak to you about his love. Loves you. It's got a plan for your life. This weightiness, this regret, this, this heaviness, this ungodly sorrow, that's not of God. Yes, we have to confront sin. We have to deal with, we have to see the reality of our sin to be able to feel the, the brokenness and the sorrow that we have to have that leads to repentance. Godly sorrow leads to repentance. Let's flip it going, I'm sorry. No, your family needs to know you're sorry. <laughs> they need to feel, if you're truly repentant towards your father, your mother, your husband, or your wife, or some coworker, or some pastor, or pastor, you, they, if they don't feel it, they don't, they don't, I mean, if you're truly broken, Everybody knows it. 
and you're not putting on a show, you're going like, I don't want to do that. I want to be forgiven. I want to be forgiven. I don't know how many times I made the error and the mistake of going where somebody says, I'm sorry. And it's like, they weren't sorry. <laughs> they weren't sorry at all. They did it again. <laughs> right? It's like, godly sorrow leads to repentance. That is not godly sorrow. What a loving God. For God so loved the world that he gave his son. Jesus so loved you and the Father that he said, I will leave the splendors of heaven. I'll leave this awesome heaven. Go down in the form of man to experience the pain of man and the temptations of man and what it's like to be tempted to sin but not sin, the, the misery of this existence outside of God so that I could pay the price for him and her, for you, on the cross, for the punishment of our sins was placed upon Jesus. And he was beat, he was pierced, he was crucified on the cross to fully and once and for all pay the price for our sin. If that ain't love. And he was put in the grave. He was put in the grave and three days later the Father when it was completely finished, he went down to, when he was in the grave, he went down to death. He went down to hell and stole the key, took the keys back of death, hell, and the grave, the ones that was taken from the Garden of Eden. When Paul would know it taken, it was given to him by Adam and Eve. He got it back. I would never forget, and I'm going to close with this, that in this encounter I have with God, with Jesus, you know, I was in this dream, this vision. You're like there. And I'm seeing Jesus on the cross and his head's down. He's just shredded. He's, he's hanging. He's crucified. You know, he's the crown of thorns is on his head. And then as he's there like this, he lifts his head up and looks me swear in the eye. And his eyes are as white as can be. And his, uh, his eyes are like hazel or something, you know. But, you know, you think it'd be all like, you know, from being beat and, and all that, that your eyes would be bloodshot. But he looked me square in the eye. And he's like, this is love. <laughs> That's, you can't express any greater form of love than what I'm doing right here for you. There's nothing else that needs to be added to this. For God so loved the world that he died for you. He don't need to sing you a song. He don't need to bless your business. He don't need to do something for you. He died on the cross for you. That, that puts a period, explanation mark, at the end of the sentence. It is finished. This is love. Paul says, have you resisted sin to the point of shedding of blood? In other words, have you begun to deal with your life of sin? Quit making excuses for it. Be broken for it. Love him back. Pick up your cross. Deny yourself and follow him. That's love. The song that says, and if, if that isn't love, then the oceans aren't real. The sky's not real. The earth's not real. God loves you. You've got to get back to love. We want to be in this place of love. People don't like it. It's okay. They can get in love with him too. <laughs> but you don't want to leave your love because they ain't in love with him. Why are you doing this? Because I love Jesus. Because I love Jesus. Jesus, why are you down on the cross? Because I love you. This is a perfect time. If you're going in a time of fasting and prayer, consider this, remember? Take it. Study what I'm talking to you about. This is not a one and done. This is like, I need to really think about this. I need to think about I need to consider this, God. It's between me and you, God. I want to be, I know what you did for me. Out of love, Lord, May everything I do for you be out of love. If that's you, I want to pray with you right now. And I, and I do believe you can, some are going to make a decision right now for God. 
But you're going to need to take some time and consider this. It's like, let's go on to the next message. Let's go to the next teaching. Let's go. No, stop. Stop all that. Stop running from teaching to teaching, but not doing anything that's taught about. Stop it. It's better to do hear one teaching and do it with the right heart than hear a thousand teachings and do none of it. You're held accountable to everything that you know. If you're going to learn more things you're not going to do, it's not going to be good. So he says, take it, study like a Rubik's Cube. Study what I'm talking to you about. Understand, I'm talking to the church of Ephesus. I'm speaking to your future. This is, this is going to happen. What are you going to do about it? I want to pray with you right now. Maybe you're going to make a decision for God. And we're excited about that. But I want you to consider it. When you make a decision for him, you're saying, I'm leaving everything for you, Jesus. I'm giving up my life for you. You give up your life for me, I'm giving up my life for you. I'm not like squeezing you in between Monday and Sunday. I am literally giving my life to you. Because I love you. Because you forgave me, because you cleansed me, because, because you brought me into the family, that you, you brought me in right standing, because I'm going to live forever with you, eternal life. How could I not live this life for you? If that's you, I want to pray with you right now. Look to your neighbor and say, consider this. Look to your other neighbor and say, consider this. You're going to remember this conversation in the future. You'll be so glad you considered it. Or you can think, I'm right. Everything's fine. I'm just going to continue doing what I'm doing. That's what Jesus was talking about to the church of Ephesus. You've fallen. You've forsaken. You're far from your first love. The things you had at first. Going after what you want instead of what he wants. I want to pray with you right now. Father God, we love you. We thank you so much for, for loving us. I want you to pray with me right now. Say, Jesus, forgive me, Lord. Forgive me, Lord, for my arrogance. For me, showing my report card to you, my works, and being offended that you didn't respond to me. That's so unloving. I'm so sorry. Forgive me, Lord. Forgive me, Lord. Bring me back to the love I had at first. The overflowing joy. The jubilance, the the willingness to lay down everything, my work, my relationships, my money, everything for you. Jesus, I know it's about love, but my heart has grown hard. I've grown weary. Soften my heart. I want to feel sorrowful if I sin. I want godly sorrow to be in my heart. I want to feel what you feel if I say something harshly to someone or, or wrongly or done something wrong. Lord God, help me to own. Own this so I can repent from it, Lord. Lord, we love you, Jesus. Let's just praise him for a moment. We thank you, Jesus. We praise you, Lord God. You are so good. What an amazing thing you've done for us. What an amazing thing. If that isn't love, then the oceans aren't real. Lord God, we thank you for the love that you have for us, God. We thank you for the love. Amen. Hallelujah. Make sure you join us because I'm going to continue as we focus on our first love. As we offer up our tithes and our offerings, now we're going to get the time to offer up our tithes and offerings to God. We're saying, my heart is yours. Because he said, where our treasure is, that's where our heart is also. Right? So I just want to bless you right now. I want to speak this blessing over you, but I want you to make this you know, part of your worship to God. This is, this is the beginning of a humbling, which is a beautiful thing. When we humble ourselves before God, 
It doesn't feel good to our flesh. But guess what? Your spirit person comes alive. It's amazing how pleasing we can be to God when our flesh has nothing to say. <laughs> it's totally amazing. Well, one thing, you know, we're saying, God, I want to honor you with your tithes and your offerings. I want to, I want to not rob you, you know, with the, with the time and the opportunity that you've given me in my life to have this increase. I want to honor you with your tithes and offerings. Listen, join with me. Go to, you know, vinefellowshipnetwork.org. Click on giving to be able to join in on the blessing and tithes and offerings. And thank you for those that are being faithful with your pledge. But listen, this is an amazing time. This is an amazing time. So I want to speak this blessing over you. I want you to say with your own mouth first, with your, hold it in your hand. I want you to decree with your own hand. Say, this is my tithe. This is my offering. It will do what God says it will do. The windows of heaven are open over me and my house, and such blessings have been released that I don't have adequate room to contain them all. The Lord is my refuge, and I make the most high my dwelling. Therefore, no harm will overtake me. No disaster will come near my home. I am the seed of Abraham, and the oath God swore to him is my inheritance. Therefore, I release my tithes and offerings into the fertile soil of Vine Fellowship Network. I got a phone call today from Preborn, which is a life ministry that you and we are a part of supporting. And they talked about the thousands of babies' lives that were saved because you gave. They talked about almost 7,000 mothers. Not only these, I'll give you the numbers later on, but sort of 70,000 babies were saved. The 7,000 mothers gave their life, over 7,000 mothers gave their life to the Lord. What an amazing thing we're doing together, right? Thank God. Together we're making a difference. We're standing for what God says to stand for out of love, you know. And so I want to speak this blessing over you, but I want to thank you for your faithfulness because together we're getting to feel. I want you to feel what you're doing. I want you to really you know, soak in what you're doing, what we're doing together so you can feel it, that it's not a religious act, but you actually are seeing the orphans blessed at Big Oak Ranch, and you're seeing the hope they have as a, as a parent in their home and has this beautiful house to be able to live in on the ranch. Or you're, you're seeing this mother walk into the clinic who is about to kill her child, but you are part of preborn, and you actually set up a preliminary uh, battle for that child. And you were there to catch her and show her her baby. Once you saw her baby, it's like four out of five mothers keep their children and they don't kill them. It's an amazing thing. There's so many things that you're doing and you need to feel it. You need to feel what you're doing because it's important to connect. You want to know what you're doing and feel that. So I encourage you as we share about on giving Sundays that you really connect. It's like amazing what we're doing together. So I want to bless you right now. I want you to receive this blessing. In Jesus' name, I declare that God's angels are busy ministering on your behalf. We're going to talk about the angels of the church today. The angel says to the church of Ephesus, well, the angels are busy ministering on your behalf. Therefore, the walls of your home will vibrate with shrieks of joy and sounds of laughter or sudden blessings that will come. God is expanding your catalog of extraordinary testimonies to share. Money's going to find you unexpectedly. It's amazing what God has done amongst our family, the VFN family and the partners. It's like, I know what's going on in the economy, but y'all getting blessed. I mean, God's just blessing everybody. It's just amazing to see what's happening. Say, like, God's good, right? God's good. I call forth wood, I call forth good pay, benefits, and raises and bonuses, a place of employment where you fit in and you have a bright future. And I bless your business. I especially bless your, uh, with them. I, I especially bless employers to find just the right person who is honest, trustworthy, dependable to find their way to your door. I speak that the Holy Spirit is now in the process of opening the eyes of your understanding. Partial truths, errors, and blind spots are yielding to fresh revelations. Say fresh bread, fresh bread. And because of the tremendous price that Christ paid at Calvary, I declare divine protection. Say divine protection. Look to your neighbor and say, that's protection from God. I declare divine protection. That's, that's 
the angel, angelic hosts of protecting you. I declare divine protections from acts of violence, inclement weather, accidents, sickness, disease, including plague and pandemic, riots and revolutions. I bless, bless America with me. I bless America and I decree revival for America and great awakening for America in Jesus' name. I want you to remember this because when it all breaks loose, you're going to say, you know what? I went through the dry, buried lands and I prophesied this is coming. And it came. The rain came. Amen, right? And let it be known that Vine Fellowship Network unashamedly stands by Israel. We pray for the peace of Jerusalem. And the scripture declares, they shall prosper that loves thee. And let me tell you something right now. Some We're getting so close to the coming of the Lord. And you look at what's happening with Israel right now. Continue to pray for her. The scripture declares, they shall prosper that love thee. Therefore, I boldly proclaim the Vine Fellowship Network is a modern-day Goshen, a place of safety and provision, a place where God's presence dwells. I bless you in Jesus' name. Say, I receive it. I receive it. You go to vinefellowshipnetwork.org, click on giving to be able to follow the prompts to join in on the wonderful blessings.